Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 9. We are in week 18 of our series in the Gospel of Mark. I'm thoroughly enjoying our time together in the Word as we listen to what Jesus wants to speak into our lives and the ways that he wants to grow us and change us. And this morning, we're going to be talking about the danger of self-reliance. Anybody tempted to rely on themselves a little bit too much and not on God enough? This might be a message of encouragement for us and challenge this morning. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about something that we, I think, all have in common. If you've lived it for any amount of time in this life, you know that life can humble you pretty quickly, right? You know that there are these moments, I, I, I call them reality checks, right? There are these moments that wake us up and cause us to realize that the way that things are, that we hope things are, is not always the way things are in the real world. So the real world is a way of bringing us back into reality. There it is. Reality check is a noun, occasion on which one is reminded of the state of things in the real world. I was thinking about Melissa and I, we've been married, I think, 18 years and I remember when we came back from our honeymoon, the bliss, we were walking on air. It was the best time of our lives. And uh, we walked up to our house, and there hanging on the door was a bill from the propane company for $600. And I was like, boy, coming back into reality here. I also remember that uh, in our first time buying a home on Guilford Avenue, uh, there in Stanton, after signing the papers for my 30-year mortgage, realizing in that moment that I had just signed up for 30 years of maintenance and taxes and bills. There is a reality that comes to bear when you buy a home. If you've ever had a baby, you know a lot about what reality is, right? The joys of having a child, but then you're up late at night changing diapers. You turn into a zombie because you might sleep four hours in three days, and it hits you, this beautiful little baby, the reality is that life is a little bit different than I thought it would be. Or what about when you graduate from college? You've spent years of your life reading, doing assignments, turning in papers, late nights, paying tuition, and then you walk across the stage, they hand you that diploma, you shout, you do your dance, whatever you do on the stage, and then reality hits you, I got to go get a job now. <laughs> I got to pay this sucker off. Reality is where we all live, isn't it, church? Reality is where we live. And if there's one thing that reality does for all of us is that it forces us to our knees oftentimes and it makes us recognize the fact that we can do nothing on our own in this life apart from God and apart from prayerful dependence upon him. And really that's what our, our text is going to look at this morning. It's, it's a, a story about the disciples having a reality check and having this moment with Jesus where he kind of peels back the layer of the situation that they find themselves in and revealing to themselves that they have not been reliant on God, but that they have been self-reliant. And I love that Jesus takes a moment to teach them this lesson because it's actually a lesson that we all need in our lives, don't we? Because Jesus wants us to live every day in the fullness of his presence and his power at work in and through us. So if you uh, want to learn a little bit this morning about what it really means to rely on God, I want to invite you to read with me from the words of Mark chapter 9, verse 14. It says this, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? Jesus asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples over there to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately 
threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Jesus, why couldn't we drive that spirit out? And he replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. The word of the Lord, church, thanks be to God. Let's try that again. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but I'm a visual person. And, uh, and I love this picture by one of the most famous artists of all time. His name is Raphael. This was his great masterpiece. It's called The Transfiguration. Many art experts and artists over time, over the many centuries since it's been painted, have said that they think it is potentially the greatest painting ever painted in the history of the world. This was Raphael's final painting that he worked on. And he didn't even get to finish it because somewhere along the, the way he died and one of his prized pupils ended up finishing this work for him. For many years, it hung on the wall of a chapel in Rome. But many years later, and even now to this day, if you travel to the Vatican, it's hanging on the wall in one of their many museums there. But what I love about this painting is that it so vividly illustrates this incredible contrast between Jesus, who you see at the top, and his glorious transfiguration there with Elijah and Moses on his left and right. And then just below them, you see Peter, James, and John cowering below Jesus, covering their eyes, shielding themselves from his blinding glory. Sadly, down on the lowest level, we see Jesus' nine disciples who stayed behind at the bottom of the mountain seemed completely lost in the sea of humanity. And there, on the very bottom corner, we see a poor, demon-possessed boy with his mouth open, suffering from some crazed delusion and being held, comforted by his desperate father. There are some scenes in the Bible that are overwhelming. This may be one of the most pathetic and overwhelming pictures that we see in all of Scripture because it paints and connects two very powerful stories. The one that we saw last week where Jesus goes up unto the Mount of Transfiguration, 9,000 feet above sea level with Peter, James, and John. And while he's there, God speaks, a cloud comes. Jesus' glory shines brighter than white lights. And Peter never wanted to come down, but wanted to stay there forever. But how many of you know that what goes up must come down? And so Jesus, along with his three disciples, began their trek down the mountain, just as Moses came down off Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments after spending a moment in the glorious presence of God. And as he came down the mountain, he found there before him the people of God with faithlessness, worshiping an idol. And in this scene, we see Jesus coming and descending from the mountain into a very similar scene of chaos and faithlessness there among his disciples. It's a very powerful, chaotic, contrasting image 
that we find between these two stories and ministry times in Jesus' life. We read this in verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and teachers of the law were there arguing with them. If you've tracked with us to this point in Jesus' ministry, you know that for the first eight chapters, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were always messing with Jesus. They, they didn't like him. He didn't fit neatly into their boxes. And, and so they had it out for him. And here we find that they had followed the disciples to the bottom of the mountain. And they were there looking for a way to trip Jesus up. They were there to find when Jesus was finally going to slip up. And in this instance, they found themselves in an argument with Jesus' disciples. Now, we don't know why they were arguing, but here's my take on why they were having this massive argument. I think it's because the disciples who were at the bottom of the mountain were completely incapable of casting out this demon. And in this moment, I think that the scribes said, this is absolute proof that Jesus, your rabbi, isn't who he claims to be. Because if you, his followers, who have been given his authority, can't even cast out this demon and give him freedom and relief and comfort, then obviously your rabbi is not a very powerful man and not able to do what he says he can do. And into the midst of this scene, Jesus just kind of walks in with Peter, James, and John. And it says, as soon as all the people saw that Jesus was there, they were overwhelmed with wonder, and they ran to greet him. And he said, what are you guys arguing with him about? And right in the middle of this crazy scene, this argument over Jesus and his authority and validity and the impotence of these nine disciples, this man breaks through all of the hubbub. This very desperate man. We read that a man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son. He's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples over here to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do anything. Now, Father's Day isn't until June 14th, but let me just take a little break and just say that dads are awesome, <laughs> right? Especially good dads like this dad. This guy, try to put yourself in his shoes for a moment, even if you're not a dad. He probably saved his son on a regular basis, like weekly, from throwing himself into fires and being drowned this was a father who lived his life with one aim, to protect his son and to keep him alive. This was an amazing dad. This was a selfless dad, a loving dad. And no matter how hopeless things got, this dad never gave up on his son. What an amazing guy. He never stopped loving him. He never stopped fighting for him or seeking a cure to what was ailing him. And he didn't seem to care in this moment about this petty squabble between the scribes and Jesus' nine disciples. He was so desperate. And he had such a big problem that he just broke through and spoke up in that moment. And apparently the disciples weren't able to help him. He said his son was possessed by a spirit. Now, we often use this euphemism in the church for sickness. Oh, that person is sick. They must have a spirit of sickness, right? That person's lazy. They must have a spirit of laziness. And in that mindset, if a person has a problem or a sickness, it must be a spirit or something like that. And this is called, I see spirits everywhere, right? And it's not helpful. And it's not biblical, 
And neither is its converse, which is saying that there is no such thing as demons. There are no problems in the spiritual realm. It's just a physical reality. It's your mind. You need to get it together and suck it up. And these are two extremes we want to avoid as Jesus followers. Everything's a spirit of something or there's no spirit of anything working in front of us. But in this case, there was a very powerful, deliberate spirit that was at work in this boy's life. And the Bible tells us that not always, but in this case, his sickness was a symptom of demonic oppression in his life. Now, the Bible doesn't say that demons always cause sickness. In 1 Timothy, Paul tells us in his letter when he's addressing Timothy, he says, Timothy, listen, I want you to drink some wine. Don't only drink water because of your ailments that you're dealing with. Paul didn't go off rebuking every infirmity that Timothy was dealing with. He recognized that there was a legitimate sickness. And he said, Timothy, drink some wine. Or you remember that one of Paul's right-hand men was a man named Epaphroditus. They were ministry partners. And Epaphroditus was left behind by Paul in Miletus because he was on the verge of death. Paul didn't say, you know, we just need to stay and pray more and fast more and cast out whatever spirit this is. Paul recognized that there was a legitimate physical issue at work in this man's life. And sometimes when we come before God, you know this from your own experience, God deals with sickness in different ways. Amen, church? I don't understand. Life is complicated. Sometimes God doesn't heal things right away. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes he doesn't heal things at all on this side of glory. What we have to recognize is that sometimes things are driven by a spiritual reality, but not always. And in this case, this little boy has been oppressed and beaten down by this dark demonic spirit for many, many years. The Bible tells us that he was mute as a result of this demon. He wasn't born mute. He was made mute because of this demon. Not only that, but he was also deaf as a result of the work of this demon in his life. We also see that this demon occasionally seizes him and throws him to the ground. And it seemed like this was done at an opportune time that the demon could find to try to wreak the most havoc in this little boy's life. In Matthew 17, we read these words, Lord, have mercy on my son. He said, he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So this demon was on every level just trying to destroy this little boy's life. We also see the father says the boy foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And if you read the same account in Dr. Luke's gospel, he gives a more vivid medical description to what this demon was doing. It says in Luke 9, and behold, a spirit seizes him and he suddenly cries out and it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. It shatters him, Luke says. Shattered is a really strong word in the original language that this was written in. It means to crush something or to break something up into pieces. Do we have any football fans in the room? Yeah, can't wait for football season, right? This word is, is an image of someone catching the ball and being hit simultaneously by three defenders, shattering them, crushing them, destroying them in that moment with that hit. This is what the father was saying that this demon was doing in this boy's life. So there's so much going on. And I, I have to have a lot of compassion as I read this for the disciples, because how many of us have ever been in a ministry situation like this before, right? A father brings you a boy like this and tells you the backstory and you're just like, um, I don't know, there's 
probably someone over there that can handle that, right? (laughs) But you see, the disciples had dealt with situations like this in the past. In Mark chapter 3, we read that Jesus went on a mountain and he called to himself those he wanted and they came to him. And he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to do what, church? To drive out demons. This is in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We read in Mark 6 that Jesus called the 12 to him and he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. And so these guys had already dealt with situations probably very similar to the one that they found themselves in that day. But for some reason, think about this with me. In this moment, they were in way over their heads. They were facing something that was way beyond their ability or the resources that they currently had to be able to address. And you and I are not the 12 disciples. But we are sent out every day, church, as representatives of Jesus. The Bible says that he has given us an authority in his name. So when we walk out into the world each day, we should go with a confidence in God's great ability. And also our total and desperate need before him. What would change in your life if you had the confidence that God could do anything that he said he could and you had the humility to depend on him in the moments that he was leading you into? See, that's just like the disciples. We encounter situations in our lives every day that are way beyond ours to handle. Think about this. Do you have a PhD in marriage counseling to be able to handle all of the situations of marital challenge or trauma of people in your own family or people that you meet? I don't, but who do we have? We have the Holy Spirit, the mind of Christ, right? And so we walk in the confidence of who God is and the humility to call on his name. There are people all around us each day who are in bondage, people suffering from sickness and mental illness. There are children whose lives are being just shredded and destroyed by the situations that they're in in their homes. And Jesus calls us, Greenmont, out into that world. Just as he called the disciples into their world and gave them authority So I think that this teaches us that when we see the enormity of what's before us each day, that we shouldn't run from it in fear. We shouldn't stand there in confidence and say, well, I've got a degree in this and that, and, you know, I've seen it on TV, or I've played that before in a movie that I've been in, and you know what? But that we say, Jesus, today, I can't do anything apart from you and apart from your power at work in my life. Amen, church? See, the world is looking for that kind of a humble, confident, dependent disciple of Jesus. People don't need my answers. They don't need your abilities, but they need God's answers and God's abilities. And look, when we do that in our lives, we move from being self-reliant to being people who are God-reliant. And here's what I found in my life that when I begin to move this way without knowing sometimes and become so reliant in my own abilities, in my own self, I've preached before, I've led worship, I've talked to people about Jesus, I've done that before, I can just do it. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even need to think about it. I don't even need to pray about it. I'll just get up and wing it because I've got the ability to do it. When we get to that place in our lives, God will generously lovingly bring a reality check and put it in our laps. And that's what he's doing here in the lives of his disciples who had followed him, who'd gone on their spiritual mission trips, cast out demons, healed the sick. But for some reason, over two and a half years, something had happened in their minds and in their souls. I don't know what it is, but it happens to us as well. 
And I don't know if it was their flesh, if it was fear, if it was complacency, if it was prayerlessness, but they got to a place where they were not relying on God and his power in their lives. Sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, that hits home for me. Jesus turned and he said in verse 19, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, if your idea of Jesus is a soft, squishy teddy bear, (laughs) that you just get to hold tightly, Jesus. Jesus just comes like the Easter bunny to deliver presents into your life, to spread flowers and make you happy, right? (laughs) This picture of Jesus is a little bit jarring for us. This picture of Jesus here is a picture of Jesus with all of his love and all of his concern addressing one of the most important issues of our life, which is unbelief. You cannot live the Christian life in unbelief. You have to live the Christian life by putting all of your eggs, excuse me, polyface people, in the basket of who Jesus Christ is and what he can do because you are now dead behind that cross and your life is moving forward in Christ and in what he can do in and through you. So he brings us to these places where he slaps us around and he says, you unbelieving people, how long do I have to put up with you? And in this moment, he's addressing the scribes who just don't want to believe, they don't care. He's addressing the disciples who, for some reason, they just tripped and fell. They lost their confidence. They lost their way. Maybe they doubted God's goodness or his love for them, as we often do. And he addressed this father, who seems to be some kind of mix of belief and unbelief at the same time. And he says, guys, you are just unbelieving. What is going on with your hearts? And it says, they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus said to the boy's father, how long has he been like this? Jesus cared about this boy. From childhood, he said, it's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. Jesus, but if you can do anything, (laughs) take pity on us and help us. And I love Jesus' response here. If you can, everything. How much, church? God, I, I struggled yesterday and I messed up and I just, I just feel like I'm not worthy of, of your love anymore. And, and we vacillate between this unbelief and this great belief in God. And God we takes this man where he is and he says, the reason that your son is not healed is not because I don't have power over this demon, but because it's a lack of faith to heal. There's a lack of faith to heal. 
And in this instance, I believe that this whole thing was a setup to teach the disciples. Jesus was about to go to the cross in six months. And the disciples had better get it together pretty soon because when he was leaving, he was going to send his spirit to comfort them and to fill them and empower them. But they needed to be confident in him. They needed to have their stuff together. And I believe this was the classroom, if you will, where Jesus is saying, have faith in me. Look what I can do even with the little bit of faith and unbelief that this father has. And when the father realized what was going on, I love his response. This man was so desperate. He was in such a place that he had no other options in his life. And he said, I do believe, Jesus. Would you please help my unbelief? I do believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus, I believe in you and that you have the power to cast the demon out of my son, but I don't believe it perfectly. My faith and trust in you sometimes wavers, Jesus. Can anyone agree with that prayer? I, I know I don't have perfect faith. I struggle. I pray that I have enough faith to access your limitless power to cast the demon out of my son. That's all I'm asking for today, Jesus. Here I am. I can do no other. And what I love is that in this moment, what the man had was enough. In other places, Jesus talks about faith the size of a what church? The mustard seed. It's like, you don't have to, you don't have, to have it up to 110%. I'll take anything you've got. I'll take that faith. And we can move mountains with that kind of faith. I'm just looking for people who are down and outers, blue collars, whoever you are, life messed up. And if you have faith in me, we can do some great things for the kingdom of God. And I love in this moment that he takes this man's imperfect faith and he makes it sufficient to heal his son. And Jesus saw the crowd and that it was running to him. It says in verse 25, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many of the people that were standing there watching this said, he's dead. <laughs> I think he died. Demon said, you might, might have more power than me, Jesus, for sure. And I have to obey you and your name and your authority. But I'm not going out without a fight. I'm not going to leave this boy without beating him down one last time, breaking his body. And I love this scene that Mark paints for us. It says, and Jesus reached down and took the little boy by the hand and he lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Jesus reaches into this place of former demonic oppression. He reaches down into this place of this boy's weakness and need and desperation, this father's desperation, and he lifts this boy up, just like he took Jairus' daughter who died, and the Bible says that he lifts her up by the hand out of her bed. <laughs> And I can just imagine almost as Jesus grabbed this boy's hand that there was some sort of transaction that happened in that moment and that all of a sudden his, his bloody hand and, and Jesus began to give him life in his body and healing and strength and the boy just stood up like this in front of Jesus. And I love what the gospel of Luke tells us. It says, Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and he gave him back to his father. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a dad. <laughs> and I can just picture this dad just cradling his son to his chest. <laughs> For the first time, in who knows how many years, maybe since he was a baby. He's holding this little boy who had been tormented, who he had saved from drowning more times than he could count. The sleepless nights had taken a toll and the bags under his eyes and, and the, the, the stress that you could hear in his voice 
from having to rescue his son. And I can just see him, tears running down his face, sobbing there and loving his son in that moment who Jesus had restored and returned to his father. You want a picture of your Jesus? (laughs) That's who your Jesus is. He reaches into those places in our lives and he pulls us out When we're under the the weight of oppression and addictions, Jesus reaches in and he pulls us out. And he doesn't just stand us up, but his touch restores us. And he strengthens us so that we can get ready to run the race with faith and confidence. What do you think that did to that father's heart that day? (laughs) Superpower confidence in Jesus Christ. What do you think happened to him when he went back to his village? How many people do you think he told about this man from Nazareth who restored his son and broke through the demonic strongholds of his life and set him free? And now his son could sleep at night and the dad could sleep for the first time in 15 years. And they were both evangelists in the powerful name of Jesus. See, when Jesus gets a hold of us, this is what happens, right? (laughs) He reaches into these places, he restores our life, He heals us and he sets us free so that we can be a vessel to share this with others. And I can just imagine the letter that son wrote to his dad. Dad, thank you for never giving up on me. Dad, thank you for always being there for me. Dad, thank you for standing with me. I'm so proud to be called your son. And here's how the story ends. And after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Jesus, why couldn't we drive that demon out? Lord knows we tried. And Jesus said, this kind can come out only by prayer. Jesus was telling his disciples, guys, You can't do what I'm calling you to do without prayer, without being in my presence, without seeking my face. You can't just run around with your tank on empty thinking that you can play at this thing because there's a reality to this that just exposed you. It exposed where you were drawing your life from and it was from yourself. It wasn't from my father. And I imagine in the years to come that this was a powerful reminder for the disciples. When they would have moments of maybe faltering, when they would have moments of despair or trial, that they would remember this moment in their life and how Jesus lovingly rebuked them. He took them and restored to them their faith in him, their confidence in him, so that they could rely on God the Father and not on themselves. And I believe this message speaks to us today too, that there's a moment in our life that God says to us, you've been a Christian for years. Maybe you you have followed me faithfully, but you're in a season of your life where you're relying on yourself. You're not turning to me in prayer. You're not seeking my face. Look at your family. Look at your marriage. Look at the fruit of your work life. And it is a lack of prayer. It is a lack of time in my presence. It is a powerlessness. It is a form of religion, but it denies the power of God. And look, I'm speaking for myself. I'm a pastor, right? I have to speak every week and I have to lead worship and and I do all these spiritual things. And I tell my wife some weeks, I'm like, I've got nothing this week. (laughs) I had nothing this week. And all I know to do in those moments is to humble myself to repent of any self-reliance in my life and to call out on my father and to say, God, I have confidence in you. Help my unbelief. I believe. And you see, God just wants to lead us in that that procession in our life and to deeper trust in him so that we can touch and minister to and pray for a broken world that's all around us that needs to be restored by Jesus. Would you pray with me this morning?
Father, we just want to say thank you for never giving up on us. In our darkness and our lostness, you've never gave up on us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to call us to you, to reconcile us to you, children to our Father. And Lord, we just come and we just say that we are like the disciples so often and that we are reliant on ourselves, not on you. And this morning we repent. God, we ask that you would fill us with your power today in these mortal broken bodies, that the glory of God would be seen and experienced, that the aroma of Christ would pour out of our lives in the crushing of our lives, Jesus, that you would be seen, you would be glorified. I pray you would fill your church today. Lord, I pray for those here who are this little boy. They are caught in, Lord, just a cycle of destruction and pain and depression and loneliness. Jesus, we just ask that you would reach in right now to these places, that you would take hold of each person, Lord, and pull them out. We pray that you would rebuke the evil one, as only you can do. Thank you, Lion of Judah, that you are a great warrior, that you love your people. We thank you that you have the victory over all things. So, Lord, we just ask this week as we go out into our world, into our jobs and our families, that you would make us aware of those needs all around us that we can't fix on our own. But, God, by your leading, we can listen, we can love, we can serve, we can touch people, we can bring a meal, we can sit with people, we can listen. God, use us. May our lives be poured out in service to our King. We just sing this chorus to close. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth, and the things of earth will grow strangely in the light of his glory and grace in the light of his glory and grace let's just sing that one more time turn your eyes Just take one more moment just to sit in his presence.